So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome everybody to the Gatan 3View webinar. My name is Paul Spellwood and I'm the Vice President of Global Marketing at Gatan and I'm going to be your host for this event. So thank you for joining us for the first in a series of webinars on serial block face scanning electron microscopy. And we're going to review current applications and techniques using the Gatan 3View system. And 3View is a high precision ultra microtome which is uh, installed within a field emission gun scanning electron microscope. For today's webinar, we will have two presenters. The first is Dr. Graham Kidd from the Cleveland Clinic, and the second is Joel Mancuso from Gatan. After Graham and Joel's presentations, we'll have time for a question and answer session. Now, to avoid noise from, from everybody impacting the presentation, all the attendees will be muted during the event. If you've got questions for the presenters, please use the lower chat box in the GoWebinar menu, type in your question. During the presentations, we'll compile the questions and then try and answer as many of them as possible in the question and answer session. Please feel free to contact us at info at if you have any questions not addressed today. If you have any problems with your audio or video or other technical aspects during the webinar, please use the raise hand icon to alert us and we'll try and sort it out. Okay, so let's get started. I'd like to hand over to Graham. Well, hi. Uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us. I was going to say good afternoon because that's what it is where I am. But um, uh, So I'd like yeah, to thank Gatan for this opportunity to um, talk a little bit about the work and the applications that we've been doing here. Um, as Paul mentioned, I'm part of the Department of Neurosciences at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, where we're interested in uh, particularly neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, we've been using our new three view system for um, uh, examining uh, issues that help us make insights into that sort of thing. I, I also have to point out that I'm a scientific advisor for our spin-off company, Renovo Neuro, um, which also has a three-view system and is using that for um, uh, similar kinds of work. Electron microscopy has always been indispensable in the biological sciences, really, because as I think most people agree, EM, it's only EM that really has sufficient resolution to resolve the, the kinds of subcellular organelles and structures that we're interested in understanding. And in the neurosciences, you know, this, this has especially been the case. Um, and a couple of good examples in point are, are Cajal's 1906 uh, Nobel Prize speech was we, spent arguing that the central nervous system is really made up of individual cells, which which touch one another, but which are not a, a interconnected um, sort of network of, of open structures. Uh, Camilla Golgi at the same at the same Nobel Prize um, symposium uh, argued completely the opposite, and it really wasn't until 50 years later to, that we were able to resolve structures like the plasma membranes on the cells that make up the central nervous system and be able to follow them to show that, in fact, Cajal was right and, and the central nervous system is made up of individual cells. Another good example that, that's close to what I am, to my heart and what we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, in examples a little later on is that electron microscopy in the 1950s really showed us also that the myelin sheaths, which form the insulation that wraps around axons, uh, both in the, in the central nervous system and periphery, is made up of part of a cell and isn't just a secretion. Then people knew a lot about its structure from X-ray crystallography and, and, and all kinds of techniques um, prior to that. But it really wasn't until we were able to follow the, again, the plasma membrane of cells like this one, which is a Schwann cell, as it wraps around and around the central axon and, and show that the whole structure was continuous with that cell. And, and that, you know, has tremendous impacts for how we understand um, neurodegenerative diseases, diseases that affect myelin, uh, and it's had a great impact on how research has conducted since then. I just point out, since I'm going to be talking about it a bit, this is a, a transmission EM of um, a myelinated fiber. This is the axon in the central region. You can see that it's made up of some cytoskeletal structures, these microtubules, but the, the main organelles in the, um, in the axon really are these mitochondria, 
and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And I'm going to be showing some of those in 3D in a little while, and so it's important to see what they look like by transmission EM. Despite the fact that TEM is really important, an electron microscopy resolution has been critical for understanding biological structures. It's really become a sort of declining specialty in the biological sciences, I think, over, over the last bunch of years. And the reasons for that is that it's a lot like manned space travel, in, in which you have some exceptionally well-trained individuals who spend years sort of learning to use specialized equipment in small, cramped, dark spaces, and largely involves taking lots of pictures, snapshots through small portholes uh, into the electron microscope, and, and you know you just see fragments of much bigger structures. The Mars rover missions was, were a revolution in um, space travel because for the first time you could explore other planets sitting at your desk and looking at your computer monitor. And the reasons that allowed this, the technology that allowed this, is, is that these approaches used highly automated um, robots. There was little personal labor involved in the actual exploration part of it, little personal labor involved in taking the photographs as well because you could just tell the system to go on and make images. They also took advantage of the um, much greater uh, density of information that we can collect now photographically. Um, but So they were able to take uh, panoramic images. And they're all able to automate image acquisition, taking a lot of the pressure off, off individual people um, and allowing the machinery to do the work. And I think for the same reason, serial block face scanning EM is, is going to revolutionize biological electron microscopy and make it accessible to uh, a lot more people and provide a lot much richer quality of information than, than has been available in the past through um, simple 2D TEM. What is serial block face scanning electron microscopy? That's a really big title. But when the postdocs come to me and say, hey, what are you doing? That looks really neat. I explain it as um, it, it's like confocal microscopy, except using electrons rather than photons. So it's a technology. Sorry, uh, it's a technology that has a long history. Um, it's been popularized most recently by Winfried Ding, but its origins kind of go back before that. For us, it's particularly relevant that it was commercial. Uh, the, the commercial instruments were produced by Gatan. Uh, that's the three-view instrument that Paul introduced at the beginning of the session. Um, and um, this is an instrument that fits onto a scanning electron microscope and um, generates uh, the, the sorts of images that I'm going to be talking about in a second. So the way it does this is to scan an electron beam across the surface of the block that's been stained with heavy metals. Um, it produces, so instead of scanning a section like transmission EM does, this actually scans the block face itself. Backscattered electrons that are generated by the heavy metals in the tissue, so these are electrons that are spun around heavy atoms, are detected and used to build up an image, which, like this one, looks a lot like a TEM image. The really clever thing about all of this is that if you build an ultramicrotome into the scanning EM chamber, you can then use a diamond knife to remove thin slices from the block surface. And so it cycles of imaging and cutting off the surface that you've imaged, then imaging the next surface, cutting that away, can produce the equivalent of Z-series stacks, which we use to then do our analysis. So there are a lot of similarities between serial block face scanning EM and confocal scanning laser microscopy. Um, and, you know, they're pertinent for biologists trying to get into or well, getting a, get a handle on this sort of technology. And so, um, you know, both are based on raster scanning approaches. So you scan a beam or you, uh, of some sort across your specimen and build up an image. There's also um, the image acquisition and, and the sectioning are both things that are highly automated. Sectioning particularly is important because that's a skill that a lot of people take a lot of time to learn for doing transmission EM which, you know, the pain of that's taken away from you when you're doing, um, uh, using a 3D system. This approach also produces panoramic and, and high sort of resolution, high definition images. Um, both approaches produce Z-series type stacks of sequential, just plain TIFF files, which can be analyzed using the same sorts of software. So it, we use ImageJ for a lot of our analysis of 3D and work, which is the same approach that we use for doing confocal microscopy. 
Um, other commercial applications also work pretty good. Um, a lot of people use Amaris and, and that software works well. Others use Amira. Um, there's, there's a host of them out there that are uh, uh, available. And, and so that makes getting involved taking a data set that you collect from a three view system and, and being able to make use of it much easier because you don't have to learn a whole bunch of new software approaches. There are some big differences though that are important. First is, you know, you get a hundred times better resolution from um, <laughs> the three view system. Uh, so, you know, looking at two to five nanometers, at least in XY, um, compared with 200 to 300 nanometers from a, a conventional confocal system. Um, I, you know, I know confocal is supposed to go smaller than that, but, but you know, that's, that's about reason. Um, heavy metal EM stains are what you use for looking at um, block face scanning approaches rather than the fluorescent dyes and antibodies and proteins that people use. And so, you know, but they're, they're largely standard sort of EM stains that um, any EM core is going to have. And so you, you can sort of plug into that. The, the tissue, of course, is fixed and it's embedded in plastic. And so that means it's, it's a, you're unable to look at living cells uh, because all of this needs to be imaged inside a vacuum. And, and without some rarefied equipment, they're not, and they're certainly not going to survive in a three view system. The size of the Z series stacks also varies, consider, uh, varies somewhat. So a typical set of images from a three view, uh, probably in the range of 50 up to 500 gigabytes. Um, would be our range uh, versus about 50 to 500 megabytes for, for a confocal stack. And so you, you, you have much richer data sets produced um, this way, but it, you know, that also takes a bit of special handling. And also by EM, the structures are delineated mainly uh, by manual tracing, uh, which means this is a good job for lots of summer students to do. By confocal, of course, it's, it's the antibodies that, that provide um, thresholding for the structures you're interested in. In practical terms, what are the advantages, really, of, you know, why, why have a 3D data set? Why are 3D data sets better? What kinds of things can you do with this kind of data set that, that you couldn't do with just looking at simple 2D um, TEM images? And I think the answer falls into sort of three, three real benefits areas of benefit. First is the um, that you can create accurate 3D models of your structures and cells or the organelles that you're interested in. Look at the connectivities that um, these cells are uh, interacting with one another in. Um, and Joel's going to show some really nice examples of, of people that have done that uh, in the next 20 minute session. For me, and what I'd like to focus on today though, is that having 3D data sets suddenly gives you a bunch of metrics that you couldn't, that we didn't have before that you can use for comparing drug efficacy or uh, effects of genes on particular um, subcellular organelles. I'm going to present some examples today of, of work that we've done in the central nervous system looking at myelinated axons, but really they're a good system that can be applied, well these approaches can easily be applied to um, uh, any cell system that, that you're in, and tissue structure that you're interested in studying. And this also allows us to tap into the huge wealth of, of serial sectioning TEM data that's already in the literature, where people have spent months, years of their lives working really hard to try and understand the three-dimensional organization of structures like synapses, um, to some extent uh, axons and, and all the tissues that everybody else is working on. Those studies may have taken them a very long time to do. We can reproduce that for single samples, uh, maybe not reproduce it, but, but you can get the same kind of data, uh, you know, within a few days using these modern block face approaches. And, and it allows you to really take advantage of that data and use it as normative data uh, for our modern, for, for current studies. I, I think the other big advantage of having 3D data sets is just that it makes learning electron microscopy a lot easier and smooths out the learning curve. If you've got a single section through something, it, it can be hard to interpret sometimes if you've got a glancing section through a mitochondrion or uh, whatever that structure is. Whereas if you've got a 3D data set, you don't have to guess what the structure might be. You can just step through to the next slices and see what they are. It's also the case that a lot of the technical things which we, we used to have to learn um, and perform in the lab and, and take a lot of time learning the craft of cutting sections 
those things are all taken care of in, in the instrument itself, and you know that frees up a lot of time and makes the the, the time cost in getting involved in this technology uh, a lot less. And so I'm just going to talk now very quickly about work that we did looking at mitochondria, looking at the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But as I say, these are things that I think are applicable to lots of different cell systems. So one of the big advantages of having a 3D data set like this is that you can just pull out individual structures, in this case, a couple of myelinated axons. Uh, the upper panel shows a single slice through two myelinated axons. Uh, this is the axon region of one. This is the axon of the other. And the dark stuff's the myelin. We're particularly interested in the distribution of mitochondria. So you can see outside the axons, here's a mitochondrion here. Uh, there's a mitochondrion under this big M there, with, which lies inside one of the axons. And our reasons for being interested in these, of course, because they're producing most of the energy within the cell. They're, um, we, we expect that they're fundamentally involved in how axons are um, uh, transmitting signals along their surface. And we were especially interested in the regions where the myelin ends, leaving the nodes of Ronvier, because these are the zones on the axon that's actually doing the firing. We anticipated that those might be regions that had a high concentration of mitochondria, and there was some evidence in the, the literature that sort of suggested that was the case. So we looked at small diameter myelinated axons. These are about a micron in diameter. So, you know, they're getting toward the edge of what you can resolve easily with a, with a confocal microscope. Um, certainly taking a bunch of these things squashed together and deciding which mitochondrion is located in which structure gets to be difficult. And the mitochondria, of course, are 0.1 to 0.2 microns in diameter, which is right on the, the edge of what you can resolve. And you know, by confocal, you really can't tell two mitochondria apart. And so by simply tracing these out and reconstructing them, we were able to get a view of the distribution of the mitochondria. We were also able to use the 3D capabilities of just being able to step through stacks of sections and look in the nodes to see whether or not mitochondria were present. And again, this would have involved an enormous amount of serial sectioning and staining if we'd done it by serial sectioning T and back in the old days when I was a graduate student. But because we've got 3D data stacks, it, it's, it's trivial to sit down and just find nodes and step backwards and forwards through them and, and see what structures are present. So we were able to put lengths and volume data um, using ImageJ and Reconstruct uh, which is free software that's that's available on the web. Uh, it allowed us to plot out our data in a lot of different ways, looking at lengths and diameters. Um, we were able to see the spread of mitochondrial sizes within, within axons, um, some short ones, some very long ones, figure out which mitochondria were contributing most to the total volume of mitochondria. These studies were done for 54 axons, which we studied um, about 600 mitochondria, and that's that's a fairly large data set to generate. But for us, the really interesting thing was when we compared mitochondrial populations at the nodes and in the internodal regions out under the myelin sheaths. What we found was that in the nodes or the paranodal regions, mitochondria tended to be short compared with the, the spread of mitochondrial sizes out under the internode. And I should just point out, these are median values. Uh, that's the median, and this is the 25 to 75 spread of, of those distributions, which, which you know, our data also showed us very quickly were not normally distributed. If you look at the volumes, the same thing is true. When we looked at the ratio of the volume of the mitochondria to the, ax, to the cytoplasm of the axon uh, in that same zone, what we found was a big surprise, which was that there's a huge variability at the node compared with other regions. The reason for this became obvious when we just went back and looked at some individual axons, which is that some nodes have mitochondria, a lot of nodes didn't, and, and that was producing this enormous spread. Now, we'd expected originally that all nodes would have mitochondria because that just sort of fitted our conceptual view of, of how axons worked. And so we went back and had a look with our data stacks to see whether or not this was always true. We were able very quickly to look at three samples from rat cerebellum, from mouse optic nerve, from mouse corpus callosum. So that's one sample corpus callosum, but three different tissues from, or uh, three different individuals from um, mouse and, and rat cerebellum, um, and, and show that, you know, somewhere between 
about 35 and 70 percent of nodes did not have mitochondria at all. Again, to do that in the old days would have involved lots of serial sectioning. It just would have been a very arduous task to be sure that there were no mitochondria at a particular node. So that really raised a question for us though. Well, okay, does that mean, you know, if about half of the nodes have mitochondria and half don't, you know, does that mean some axons always have mitochondria at their nodes or not? And we're fortunate that the three view system can give us these enormous panoramic views of what uh, this is a piece of optic nerve um, from a, a mouse central nervous system. And that really provided us with the opportunity to go back and look at very long reach segments of axon and then answer questions like that. And so this is one of 32 axons that I was able to pull out of the data set, or I, I stopped at 32, I could have kept going. We have the, the, the long length, which is about 400 microns of axon to that we can follow. But you also still have that high resolution that allows you to see the mitochondrial structures and, and other organelles. And what we were able to show very quickly was that um, the, the distribution was actually binomial, so it was more or less random. So all of that's great for looking at wild type animals and it taught us a lot about what we could do uh, about how axons were organized. But for us, the big benefit of this is that it now allows us, it gives us a sensitive metric that we can use for looking at the effects of transgenic um, disruption of mitochondrial proteins, axonal, axonal proteins, uh, and their impact on, uh, particularly in the early stages of disease. So this just shows an example of an axon from um, a myelin mutant, uh, in which one of the myelin genes has been knocked out and another one was replaced. We knew from looking at even one month old tissue that occasionally you would see regions where mitochondria were disrupted and these are all the mitochondria shown in this reconstruction down here. But we don't see any clinical deficits in these animals until about six months of age. And when we came and looked though at the mitochondrial metrics, what we discovered was that if you just look at their volume, of the spread of volumes of mitochondria. There was no big story. There seemed to be no tremendous difference between the mitochondria that were present either in wild type in green or the myelin mutant in, in orange at one month, three months or six months. But when we looked at the other paramet parameters, mitochondrial length, mitochondrial diameter, there were huge differences that were evident from one month that, that really never recovered even out to six months of age. And so um, the mitochondria tended to be much shorter, their diameters were much greater. And, and so what you have is a bunch of, uh, the, as a population, the mitochondria in these mutants from the time of the first myelination were, were defective. They were small rounded up mitochondria that, that never really developed into the long mitochondria we saw in, um, in normal healthy animals. And so, you know, long before we could see neurological phenotypes in these tissues, we were able to detect using these 3D parameters changes that were occurring. We were also especially interested in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. These are structures that are maybe um, 50 to 100 nanometers in diameter. So they're well beyond what you can see easily by confocal microscopy. And if you, you just look at axons, SER staining, um, what you see is a kind of green blur by confocal microscopy in these, these very small axons. But with 3D EM, we were able to uh, come back in and reconstruct the endoplasmic reticulum shown here in green and showed that it's organized as a, an interconnected network of um, tubules that, that connect, that branch and uh, extend more or less along the entire length of the axon. If you just look at a single slice through them, you don't really get much feel for what their structure is. but in 3D, you get a really clearer uh, uh, view of that. And previously, people had used high voltage um, tomography approaches to demonstrate that this was the structure. And, and that was great, but that worked best for small segments of, of individual axons, whereas we're able to do this for large numbers of axons for, for substantial lengths. 
We're also able to use this approach once you've segmented out the, the endoplasmic reticulum. You can ask questions about how much of it is just adjacent to the um, axonal plasma membrane, uh, where it's, it's probably effective in sequestering calcium, um, versus how much is associated with mitochondria, simply by doing some, some differential thresholding. And so here in cyan is the SER that's associated with the plasma membrane. In yellow or in white is the ER associated with mitochondria, which are these red structures in this image. Um, what we found was about 50% of the axonal endoplasmic reticulum normally lies just beneath the axonal surface, with about 5% around mitochondria uh, in, in these tissues. Where we got a big surprise was when we looked at the organization in these myelin deficient mutants, in which um, what we saw consistently was that the endoplasmic reticulum structure was fragmented, often beaded up and, and blebbing, um, sometimes associated with mitochondria, but, but there are often big gaps in the organization. And, and that this persisted all the way along the axons that, uh, that are present in these animals. None of this would have been evident from single slice scan, uh, single slice TEM type images because it just, you know, it all looks the same between wild type and, and treated. And it's not until you get the three dimensional structure that you can really tell this. So I probably gone over time and for which I apologize, but let me just, if I can sum up quickly, I think block face SEM approaches really offer dramatic potential for the future. And I think as Joel's going to show, Fully automated uh, or, uh, you know, in uh, comparative connectomics approaches and with automated um, uh, thresholding in the future is, is really just going to revolutionize the way we look at neural networks, uh, at tissue architecture in, in other structures, and um, the deployment of organelles. But a lot of that's sort of for the future, currently I think we can really use the speed and reproducibility of the serial block phase scanning EM to provide us with a new class of cellular metrics that just we didn't have before. They allow us to compare mitochondrial, ER structure, volumes, localizations, synapse size, the vesicular structure, the distribution um, in, in ways that we've never previously been able to do with large enough st numbers that, that we can do statistics on them to detect small differences. Um, with extensive automation, um, you know, the, the, the cost of getting involved in this has become much easier. And, you know, I should just point out a couple of caveats, which is that, you know, now we sort of move the bottleneck from the technical parts of cutting sections to, to computer analysis. Um, data storage has also become an issue. And, you know, it is still essential to have somebody involved in projects that does know how to interpret EM artifacts so that people coming into this fresh aren't interpreting bad fixation as, as pathology. But despite all of that, you know, th this is a technique that has um, uh, remarkable potential, and I think we're on the cusp of a, of a revolution in biological electron microscopy. I'd just like to acknowledge um, people at the Cleveland Clinic. A lot of this work was done in Dr. Bruce Trapp's lab, um, and some of the tissue was run up by Nobu and Andy. Uh, this, of course, is part of a much larger series of studies that involve other technologies. I, I should also mention Renova Neural. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm a consultant or a, a science advisor for them. Renova is a Cleveland Clinic spin-off company that was um, does preclinical testing for drugs and they use a lot of the same sorts of techniques that I've been describing for analyzing um, drug testing and, and um, methods like that for uh, analyzing um, MS-related neurodegenerative disorders. But the important thing here is that they also will do samples for outside customers. And so if you're interested in getting in contact with them to um, get samples run or uh, are thinking of trying this technology, you know, this is one place where you can do that uh, commercially and um, Joel or I can put you in contact with them. Uh, a lot of this work was also done in collaboration with guys at Case Western Reserve. We're fortunate in Cleveland that we have a sort of concentration of people involved in EM. Um, and I just mentioned Amir and, and Nan Avishai and Art Hoyer, uh, that location. Uh, who've been very helpful. And of course, Joel Mancuso has just absolutely been indispensable uh, to us getting going in all of this. And he's now going to show you some examples of um, other applications uh, for, for 3D EM. Joel.
Thank okay. You. Thank you very much, Graham. All right, Graham, thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all the attendees for taking time out of their day to uh, spend some time with us to learn about 3D EM and, and 3View in particular. So um, as Graham said, I'm Joel Mancuso, uh, part of GATAN, working on the 3V system for the last few years, and I just want to go over some um, a few key points um, Talk about 3D EM challenges and what, what has kind of hindered collecting three-dimensional data and how 3View approaches to, um, and solves these problems. We'll talk a little bit about sample preparation because this is a little bit different uh, than your typical TEM sample. And then we'll talk a little bit about the workflow of zero block face imaging and, and just introduce the differences between TEM and SEM. And finally, we'll just show a bunch of data sets uh, that we collected using the 3 view system with a few collaborators uh, uh, around the world. So as Graham said earlier, uh, this technique is known in the literature as zero block face scanning electron microscopy. So another acronym to your list, SBFSEM. And you know, the real important part is the zero block face. Uh, again, zero addresses this idea that we're taking uh, a number of images one after another through a 3D volume. And the block face is important because unlike TEM, where you image a section itself, we are imaging the block face. And so this solves a number of problems that is associated with, with imaging uh, in 3D with using the EM microscope. So a few things that's kind of hindered uh, the adoption uh, of three-dimensional electron microscopy. And in most cases, if not all, you know, advanced expertise is, is required, either you need someone who's patient enough and, and knows the skill of ultra microtomy and they can collect section after section after section, or you really just need someone who's really into electron microscopes. And as Graham alluded to earlier, it, this is kind of a dying class of individuals within the biological field. Uh, there are volume limitations uh, when collecting 3D electro, you know, a 3D data set. If you use a tomogram, uh, you, you're generally not going to collect a series of tomograms. So you're, you're still limited to, you know, one to two, maybe 300 nanometers in volume in it's the thickness of your section. If you're going to collect serial sections, uh, you're limited to how patient you are and how many sections you can collect. Uh, one of the big problems collecting sections is missing data. And if you look, the second image on the right is a copper grid with a number of, of a ribbon of sections on it. And every once in a while when you stain these grids, which you need to do to generate the contrast in an electron microscope, you, you pop a grid and you can lose the sections. The sections are laying on roughly 50 nanometers of material, so it's, it's a very fragile system. Uh, another bit of missing data is in the, in the technique of tomography, and, the, and that just stems from the fact that you can't rotate your grid completely parallel with the beam, so it creates this missing wedge or missing data. Uh, it does take a lot of time to, to learn these techniques and to actually do these techniques. Um, a typical data set for three views, somewhere around 1,000 images, collecting 1,000 sections you know, could take a month, and that's just collecting and cutting the sections. You still have to image and then reconstruct the volume itself. Uh, one big artifact associated with Ultra microtome is the compression of the section you're collecting. Remember, these are thin pieces of plastic. Uh, they're 50 to 70 nanometers. And when you cut them, they actually compress. The problem is that they don't all compress in the same manner. So each section is slightly different. So when you put the data back together, you have to kind of correct that section distortion and compression. So how does three view solve or address these issues? And I think the big take-home message here is that 3V really successfully removes the barrier entry uh, into acquiring EM data and 3D EM data. And I'm, I'm just going to show this movie as a caveat of an example of 
an individual who I trained up in Helsinki. This comes from Ilya Beldovich up at the University of Helsinki. He was hired to do software, and he wanted to, to sit in on the training to to hope in hopes that understanding how 3 view collects data, he could write a better algorithm for auto segmentation. Um, he went through the training, and nine months later, I saw him at the cell biology meeting, that's past cell biology meeting in December, and he showed me this movie, and I was completely blown away. Nine months ago, he had never collected an electron microscope data set, and now he's showing me one of the most beautiful movies I've seen in 3D. Uh, this was done with his program that he is developing on auto segmentation, but it's just absolutely stunning, and I think it's a brilliant example of going from absolutely no EM expertise to stunning data. 3View also addresses this volume limitations. I talked about um, in, in the terms of tomography, it's, it's very difficult to take a series of tomograms. It's possible, but very difficult. So if we think in just terms of serial sectioning, uh, you know, if you're going to collect 200 sections, that'll give you roughly 10 microns of, of tissue depth. Um, I took a number. This is somewhere around 400 cubic microns. This is a number from Winfrey Dink's paper recently published on the, the retina connectome. And this was the data set or the volume that they collected to establish the connectivity of the retina. So this is very much based in um, real data. Um, the idea that the microtome is completely automated kind of removes this potential for the missing data associated with human error. And in addition, because it's automated, we have this overnight acquisition. Most of the time uh, that I collect the data set, I set, I set the sample up uh, somewhere around lunch, and I let it run overnight, and I come in the morning, and I take the sample out, put a new sample in, and, you know, start plugging away again. And that, that data set, that amount of time can yield anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 images. So time becomes uh, less of a factor because while it's acquiring the images in automated fashion, that can be off doing something completely different. And then finally, the, the idea of compression or distortion of your of the images when collecting thin sections, because we're imaging the block face, we don't have that same compression issue. The block face is completely rigid, and it's the section itself that gets distorted. But by the time we cut, we're no longer interested in a section. We're interested in the new surface of the block face. So you've heard a lot about, about TEM and SEM, and I just want to do a quick comparison of, of typical images that we're used to in each of those modes. So in a scanning electron, electron microscope, we're used to looking at the surface of things. So on the left, we have pictures of red blood cells. And in TEM, it's much more useful because we can actually see what's going on inside of the cell. But then to do that, we need to actually cut the cell open. On the left-hand side is now uh, an image of a serial block face uh, taken with the three-view system. And it looks very much like uh, the TEM. So how does that happen? And it all starts with sample preparation. Uh, we use the same type of uh, basic TEM preparation. It's very similar. We, we both use uh, fixatives, glutaraldehyde. You can even high-pressure freeze your samples. Uh, the samples are dehydrated and infiltrated with plastic. The big difference is before we infiltrate the samples with plastic, we stain the sample. We get as much stain into the sample before we polymerize uh, in hard epoxy resins. And that's because when you cut a thin section, you have the chance to stain that section. But in this imaging modality, we really don't have the opportunity to do that, so we incorporate the stains beforehand in a, in a blo in block staining strategy. So this is a three-view system. You can see the scanning electron microscope. Um, and we remove the door of the scanning electron microscope and replace it with the three-view door. The microtome is actually attached to the door. But you can see, just get an idea of the proximity of what's going on inside the chamber. We have the microtome itself here, the diamond knife, which we'll get a little bit better view on in a moment. And this is the pole piece where the electrons exit um, the, the column. You can see this is very close confinement. You can, 
the amount of space between the sample surface and the, and the bottom of the pole piece is somewhere about five microns, or excuse me, five millimeters. So here we have the diamond knife, we have our sample. Right above the diamond knife is our electron backscatter detector, and that's what's going to generate the signal uh, of the images we collect. So after shaving the surface, we're going to raster the beam over the surface of the sample and generate an image. Once the image acquisition is complete, we're going to bring the knife back to the sample. And in this case, we're showing that we're cutting 15 nanometers, but you can cut anywhere between 15 and 200 nanometers. We're going to shave off a new slice of the sample, and we're going to scan the next image. And so this is the typical automated fashion the modality of serial block face imaging. So let's show some, let's show some data. This is a typical data set. Um, fairly low mag, I think, believe around 50 nanometer pixels, but I wanted to show kind of an overview of a large field of view. That's fine. And Danny, we can we could actually trace dendrites. You may even be able to pick out individual spines on, on the dendrites themselves, but you may not be able, or certainly will not be able to count synaptic vesicles. So we really want to take advantage of the the resolution of the electron microscope, we want to image it more resembles this. These are 30 nanometer cuts and about six to seven nanometer pixels. You can see clearly that we can see each vesicle looks like a halo. We can see the Christi of the mitochondria, and you're even able to pull out some of the cytoskeletal elements such as microtubules in the dendrites. Now there's a fair amount of compression we have to, to uh, apply to these videos to make them play smoothly over the internet, or at least I hope they're playing uh, smoothly over the internet. So I just wanted to show you two still images from this data set to give you the idea of image quality. So this is the full field of view from uh, the movie I showed previously. And again, that movie was just a small area. We'll zoom up to that area. This image is 4,000 pixels by 4,000 pixels, with roughly a field of view of uh, 50 microns. So we zoom into this red box. This is the type of resolution this image has over the whole 4K by 4K region. And again, you can start to pull out high resolution features such as the synaptic vesicles, which look like halos. We're able to pull out synapses. Down on my mouse in the lower left-hand corner, you're starting to see microtubules. So this is what the raw data looks like without any filtering or, or uh, post-processing. So what do you do with these images? Uh, Graham pointed out earlier that you can segment out uh, specific cells of interest. Now this becomes an arduous process and, and a lengthy process when you have to do it by hand. And there are groups that are trying to automate this uh, using uh, specific algorithms. But this, was, this particular portion of this dendrite was done by hand. Um, it, and you're able to actually start doing metrics on a model such as this. If you had a wild type versus knockout, you could count the number of spines. You could even pull out individual vesicles and, and start uh, quantifying populations of vesicles. So let's we'll zoom out and just show the dendrite one more time, and then we'll move on. OK. This is a data set from University of San Diego, California, Mark Ellisman's group at the National Center for Microscopy and Imaging Research. And this was a large field of view, but again, it has a high resolution over the entire data set. So we're looking at the nat uh, natural resolution. There's been no post-processing involved. You can actually start pulling out. I know it's playing very, very fast, but you can pull out individual vesicles, Golgi, ER, um, and this is the type of resolution that you have over the huge, and this was an over 100 micron field of view. This is another data set that comes from the Ellisman Group in collaboration with George Spear at the University of West Virginia. And he studies these, these huge, gigantic synapses of the calyx of hell. And what he has is a group of summer students. I went to his website the other day and I could see a few advertisements for summer student uh, internships. And you can guess that they are spending hours upon hours going back and tracing out um, 
three view data sets to create beautiful models like this. And I absolutely love this model because it really demonstrates the overall field of view that you can get from the three view system, but you can still start to pull out the high resolution data. And so you have the best of both worlds. You can see the forest, but you can also see what's going on at the le at the resolution of the leaves. And I'll let this play through because it gives a, it gives a few credits at the end of the movie um, to George and his lab and to Mark and, and Tom Durink, who who sits in front of the three view and makes the magic happen. And I absolutely love that movie. I think it's it's just just gorgeous. I do want yeah, to that's trust. an amazing data set. It, it's just beautiful. Um, I just really quickly want to touch on um, stability. And this was a data set that we collected here at the Catan Applications Lab. Um, I've shown this uh, for a while now, but this was 6,000 images. You know, the original image size was 4K by 4K, and the slice was 50 nanometers. So we've gone over 300 microns of, of, of tissue. And this took roughly nine days. And I show this as an example of the system is very stable and can run for not just overnight and not just a week. And in fact, the, when I pulled out that volume number to show what's possible earlier on in my presentation, that was from a data set that went for Dig took that took just about a month. So if you have the luxury to have the microscope free for that period of time, this system can take advantage of, of weeks or months of data acquisition. The last slide I'm going to show is just an example of, and I titled this Beyond TEM, and I do it in the terms of how thin we cut. Uh, these were 15 nanometer cuts and, and uh, 9 nanometer pixels. I say it's Beyond TEM for the simple fact that cutting and collecting a 15 nanometer section to be put in a TEM is near impossible. And if you did get it into the TEM, it's not thick enough to generate proper contrast that we're used to seeing because electrons just have too much energy to pass to pass through 15 nanometers. Why we can do this in three views because we're not really we're not interested in this section. We're interested in a new surface. So we're not interested in the integrity of the section. And so this is very routine in, in three view and zero block face imaging. This data set was collected in Japan after installation of the system, and two days later we're going through the checklist and we, we cut 15 nanometers. And so it's very routine to cut this thing with the system, although you may not wish to always cut them so thin. depends on the type of questions you have. So I want to wrap up real quickly here so people can ask questions. Um, I just want to Two things from this slide I really want to drill home. One, that block face imaging in a three view really simplifies electron microscopy. It, it, it removes this barrier of entry that, that I like to think of it was the microtome. You no longer have to cut. You no longer have to collect sections. And removing that really opens the door up to this type of imaging to anyone, even if you don't have uh, EM background. And the other thing is stability. Uh, this is an extremely stable system. Um, you know, like I said, Dank system is run on the order of a month or more, and we've done weak runs. And most often, and, and Graham can can chime in. Is, you know, most of the time, we run overnight. In overnight, you can collect ten to twenty to thirty gigabytes of data, which is more than enough to keep a graduate student busy for <laughs> for a few months. So with that, uh, I'd really like to give a special thanks to Graham Kidd and the Cleveland Clinic for participating in this webinar um, and to, to share his data of, of really starting to apply metrics and measurements to 3D EM data sets. Uh, just, a, just a few uh, data acknowledgments. Uh, Naomi Kamasawa was the 15 nanometer uh, section. George Screw was that beautiful blue uh, reconstructed synapse. And, and Mark and Tom at... Uh, University of San Diego for uh, supplying a few movies for us to show. So with that, I thanks, thank everyone for attention, and I'll turn it over to Paul. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed to both Graham and Joel for their presentation. And we've been collecting some questions uh, during, the, during the talk, and um, we'll start with, with the first question, which, uh, which we will show now. Um, 
So the first question is, can I use the same sample preparation method for three view imaging as for regular TEM? So Graham, what's your view on that? Um, at present, probably not. Um, the um, three view approach really takes a lot more metal in the sample than you can get than you get with the, the little bit of osmium that we normally put into uh, a sample that we run up for TEM. Because with TEM, normally you stain the tissue afterwards, and that's where it gets all of, all of its um, contrast from. Uh, so with this prep, we need to run the tissue up through several changes of um, osmium and other heavy metals. We stain the tissue itself on block before running it up so that um, the, the metal's actually in the tissue. Uh, then you start imaging the block face. So, so unfortunately, probably not. But a lot of us are pretty interested in trying to find ways in which we can take advantage of, you know, the the, the huge closets full of um, TEM blocks that we've generated over the years. Um, and um, so, you know, at some point in the future, we might be able to do something like that. But right now, no. I, I like the term you use uh, in the past of bucket chemistry. That, that's <laughs> Our, our sample preparation protocol is, is really straightforward, and most of the chemicals are, are probably found in your lab, and if not, they'll be found in an like EM core facility, but it is approachable to, to anyone. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It really, it's not a difficult technique. Uh, we basically, I train one person to do it. Uh, we just do it in a fume hood using the reagents that we've got around our EM lab, um, and, and once they've seen how to do it, they train the next person, um, and so you know we've we've had a good um, good success in in you know people passing that that approach on. Okay, great. So basically, it's not that difficult, and um, you can find a friendly EM guy or girl to help you. Okay, so, yeah, totally. so the next question: um, Can three view data be correlated with data from confocal? Uh, perhaps Joel, you'd like to start. Yeah, we 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 did some work with David Dinsdale at the MRC where we're able he was able to image uh, a cell grown on a photo etched cover slip live that was expressing GFP and we watched it through the process of fixation. So we added uh, cooler aldehyde, we dehydrated, we finally polymerized it in resin. We were able just to make sure that that cell didn't move. The advantage of the photo etch. Uh, cover slip is that you can see it in the light microscope, so you can see, oh, my cell is at C4, but after polymerization, you pop off that grid, you can relocate that cell C4, and then you can cut it up and put it into the electron microscope. So yes, it's very much possible to do that correlation. Um, you know, it does take a fair amount of effort, and I, I like to say it takes a lot of accounting, because you just want to make sure that everything is squared away and that your cell didn't just disappear along the process. Okay, thank you. Um, and so our, our next question, um, we already have a, an SCM. Can we put a three view on it? Uh, let's ask that to Joel. Well, there are three things that are important for putting a three view on an SCM. The first is that we're the electrons or the electron source. We would recommend a field emission gun. There are a lot of SCMs out there already with a tungsten filament, which isn't stable enough for a three view. The other two factors are the chamber needs to be large enough to accommodate the three view. And finally, we recommend having an SEM that already has a variable pressure system to help with the imaging of, of the three view samples. So if your, if your SEM has those three things, field emission gun, large enough chamber, and a variable pressure, it most likely can fit three view. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, the next question which we have, um, what is the thinnest section I can cut? I guess both you guys would like to comment on that. So perhaps we'll start, Graham. We, we routinely run, I guess, most of our samples, we end up running not at the thinnest sections that you can cut. Um, we're most of ours are like 50 to 100 nanometers because we want to get through the tissue reasonably quickly. Um, I've cut, I think, 30 uh, for one set of samples that we were doing, but, but that, that's nowhere near the limits of what the system can generate. And, and for that, I'll, I'll transfer over to Joel. I, I, Graham, you bring up a good point. It's, it's not a question of all the time of getting the highest resolution data. It's matching the data acquisition to, to the questions you're answering. 
And if you need a large volume, you may not need information every 15 nanometers. You may or So in, in a sense, uh, I like to have people really think about the amount of data they're collecting. And at 15 nanometers, uh, if you need to go over 200 microns, that is just an enormous amount of data to handle. Um, but um, to answer the question is simply, you know, the system is un not unlike any other electron microscope in terms of biological samples and resolution. It, it's fair to say that biological samples really limit the resolution of what the full uh, or the full resolution of an electron microscope, and we never really realize the full resolution using biological samples. Um, if we use that idea, I, there is a three view system up in Manchester that and they're they're cutting aluminum. Aluminum is really robust under the beam and doesn't really degrade at all, and they're cutting as thin as two point five nanometers. Same three view. Um, We've never been able to realize that with a biological sample. Because when you radiate the sample with an electron beam, the resin becomes soft. It becomes difficult to cut. So um, the thinnest we've gone uh, with biological sample is 7 nanometers. But the system is spec'd out to 15, and is a more, 15 is a more routine number. Okay, good. So really it's a question of working out what resolution you want, what volume you want, how long you've got, how long you want to leave the machine to run, and then optimizing all the parameters. Um, okay, so the next question. What's the longest period of time in which the three view system can run in an unattended and automated operation? Joel. Uh, oh, well, go ahead, Graham. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say our system, the longest I've let it run and shouldn't have touched it, it was for about four, four or five days when it, when the system ran, it stayed perfectly in focus. It cut everything really nicely, and whenever I touched it, I just made things worse. So um, <laughs> that that was a fairly good run. I guess we've run it for a week, um, in which I just came in and and tweaked the focus a little bit, um, stigmation a little bit. Um, our system usually runs with. A, few people using it and, and somebody just comes in and checks focus, you know, whenever they're walking by to do something else uh, and, and we kind of keep it running that way. But but a lot of the time it, it just doesn't need assistance. And so so for us practically, you know, uh, five or six days is, is not ridiculous. But I know you've run them for, for much longer, Joel. Yeah, I've, I, the longest run I've done here is nine days. Um, yeah. And, you know, dank, you know, when you have these connectome questions, you need high resolution over a large volume. So those tens of runs get you know, to be fairly long. And I, I believe his was up around five weeks or six weeks that they, they collected that data set. It may even address the actual number in his recent publication on the, on the retina. Our biggest okay. limit... Um, Sorry, if I could just say our biggest limit on runtime is, is that the other users will come along and beat you up if you try to take the system out for a week at a time just to, to do one sample to see how long you can run it for because, um, uh, you know, we, we have a number of people that have got um, good projects going on that, that need time. And so, um, yeah, that, that's our biggest constraint. Oh, you just need you just need another system, Graham. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so 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 now we're going to go to the final question that we've got time for, and um, and it comes back to um, some some of the earlier discussions. Well, which one should we have, John? Uh, okay, let's let this one. Is a good this one. one. How, how, can we, how can we image molecules using antibodies or EGFP? So, Graham. you the um, this is a question that biologists ask a lot because you know it's it's fundamental to what we do. There are a couple of methods around f which will allow you to um, uh, stain up structures using either a little bit of antibody staining or endogenous EGFP. Those are in the literature, and if you have a look through, you can find them. Um, DAB conversion of EGFP. Mark Ellison's group's also got the Minisog uh, construct that can be transgenically used to um, label up neurons and or label up whatever cells you're interested in. That also can be converted into an electron-dense uh, material that can be used. But I think 
we're kind of in the early days of using this technology. We're adapting old TEM technology to um, and making use of that, both in our resin choices and staining methods and, and all of that. And I think we're just starting to think seriously about, you know, how we can optimize approaches for this sort of 3D approach, what resins are going to work best, what kinds of stainings are going to work out for us. And, and you know, I think in the next couple of years we'll see some really good ways of, of being able to, label up structures that we're interested in that, that haven't been used. But right now, there, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, they're just not perfect. Okay. Well, I'm afraid I have to draw it to a close there. Thank you very much to Graham and Joel for their presentations and, and their insightful answers. That uh, concludes our three-view webinar. We hope all you people on the, on the webinar found the topics interesting and relevant for you. If you've got questions or you'd like to participate in the next webinar, please send us an email at info at So thank you again for joining us and goodbye.